gentlemen welcome to the frank williams show and of course i am frank williams and i have a special guest today her name is liz jackson simpson she's the ceo founder executive director of success san francisco right in san francisco california so liz how are you today fine thank you frank for having me well, yes i'm, I'm, I'm very excited glad to have you here thank you so tell our people out there you know about your agency what you do how long you've been in operation sure sure well um success center san francisco um was formerly known as the youth guidance center improvement committee that was started over 32 years ago by superior court judges who saw the need to improve the vocational and educational outcomes of initially young men who were returning to community from Log Cabin Ranch, um, but has evolved over the decades to serve um, marginalized young people from the juvenile justice system, foster care system, um, as well. Now we just took, taken on the uh, mantle leadership and management of a career one-stop center in the Western Edition. So, um, you know, uh, we just believe that um, the only way for um, individuals that come into our organization are going to be able to thrive or survive in this life, in this world, is through um, alternative education opportunities and linkages to the workforce. So basically, you're working with uh, at-risk youth, then, in other words, right? From the, yes. Some from the penal system. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. So... Um, Tell us a little more about your passion and your involvement. What made you? Why take am on I this? here? Right. Well, oh my goodness, Lord only knows. By trade, I am uh, an engineer. I have a background in industrial design, so I thought I was gonna be out designing jewelry or interiors or fabrics or anything. But um, um, God has a funny sense of humor. Okay. He decided I was gonna design human systems, and so um, being powerful. a past. Um, Trent's Award awardee, change agent, I it really gave me the realization that that's I was a designer of people systems, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm I'm real proud of uh, proud of that today, um, so thank you for that as well too, um, but we um, we like I was saying we have a a school called the Early Morning Study Academy that was. Um, Probably for the longest time, it's been a kind of our flagship program because uh, we noticed that young people were coming to us looking for employment, but many of whom didn't have a high school diploma or GED. And coming from a really strong academic background, I went born and raised here in San Francisco, attended Lowell High School, went to San Francisco State University, lots of coursework at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm diabolically opposed to putting anybody to work who hasn't at least achieved a high school diploma or a GD. Um, and for many of our young people who have been in and out of the system, um, this alternative approach um, was critical and essential because who with 13 credits wants to look at, and you're 19 years old, wants to look at four years of high school. But we're able to ready them f in partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District and, and the Community College District in four to six months um, with the GED. And they can still go on and go to college and be productive in the workforce with the GED. And in fact, today, the new test is even more rigorous um, and tests for job readiness and college admissions. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'd like to even credit it as even being more um, valuable almost than even a high school diploma because you test out. It's not something subjective that somebody else is saying, oh, Frank, um, you deserve an A. But this test, this validated standardized test is saying you've mastered this knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to um, encourage young people to not look down at families, not to um, tort a GED, but see it as a, a different pathway to getting you what you need and what you want. Um, we still operate our job readiness and job training programs for young adults or what the city calls TAYS, transitional age young people, um, as well as our career one-stop center in the Western Edition. 
um, where we see about 4,000 people a year who come in and we touch them with services. Um, the center is located at uh, 1449 Webster Street. Um, we're open five days a week, and tonight we're open as late as 7 because mm -hmm. we realize um, we have two customers, not only the job seekers, but businesses in the community that want to learn about many of the city services or state services like bonding or hiring tax credits that are available to them or just you know small businesses learning how to better market themselves or um, QuickBooks tutelage or access to a fax machine and a, and a copier um, is available not only for the job seekers but for the businesses as well. Um, and we're blessed to have a very talented staff as well. Most of our staff um, have advanced degrees and um, more savvy than I um, in uh, many of the realms. Although I've been doing this work for a long time, we have, we have individuals working with us that are clinicians um, that um, have been doing workforce development for many years who have strong connections and linkages to the workforce. And so um, that's important, and I, and I credit uh, the very talented staff of Success Center for this incredible growth spurt that we've had over the past um, five years. That's fascinating. Um, you mentioned a couple of programs that's up on the Success uh, Center, right? Mm -hmm. And um, one was working with the, uh, TAD, the TAD uh, stand for acronym? Oh, Transitional Age Youth. Okay, mm -hmm. Transitional Age Youth, and that's between the ages of? Um, 16 to 24. 16 to 24. Yeah, that was a, there was a Stanford study by Dr. Michael Wald, um, I guess in about 2003 or 2004, um, that highlighted um, most young people, regardless of your background or circumstance, are not ready to transition into adulthood at the age of 18. And for young people that have come through the juvenile justice system or the foster care system, which are the individuals that we care most about, um, they're even more vulnerable um, to ending up into institutions like your organization works with um, uh, in jail, mm -hmm. in the mental health system, mm -hmm. um, subsisting on welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't see that as positive outcomes for our young people. And so we have, over the years, it's kind of been a niche that we've fit into, um, is trying to help and support, keep young people out of social systems and allow, give them the tools and the resources to thrive. Um, and now it's flavor of the month, right? A lot of a lot of organizations, and thankfully the city is really, and the voters in the last election um, voted to extend the and to recognize the need of transitional age young people. So um, after many, many years of, of advocacy, it's finally becoming um, an issue that the community is rallying behind. So we're, we're grateful to that because... You know, we don't, we don't, we see good coming out of our young people. We see them with the right resources being captains of industry. Well, you've been a, you've been an advocate for many years, though, on many different levels from, from grassroots to city hall, like advocating and yeah, raising yeah. funds to help this population, you know, and you've been working with the criminal justice system for many years too, correct? Yeah, we, um, I'm retired from the juvenile probation department. I had a stint there as the director of the community programs division, and I work with um, the private industry council, which was the predecessor to the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. So I've been able to, um, I've been privy to be exposed over the years um, to be able to do both, you know, a lot of um, local work as well as being part of, you know, and, and some national um, initiatives as well too, like the Youth Opportunity Grant where we, um, I co-authored a grant uh, for $28 million, which was probably the largest infusion of federal dollars for young people, again, transitional age young people, mm -hmm. from the federal government. Um, and then we had a substantial portfolio of, um, when I worked with the juvenile probation department as well too, to begin to coordinate a system of care for our young people and our families, both in and out of um, detention. Um, and so, um, and even now we're, um, with um, Success Center, we're 
being able to really, and that was kind of my job coming into Success Center five years ago, taking over as a, its first ever executive director, because it's always been kind of this quasi-governmental thing, um, especially with the judges at the helm, to revamp it, mm -hmm. um, change its name, merge it with another organization that has a legacy of, um, of um, work with transitional age youth, um, Youth for Service, which used to be just right down the street from here, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it um, They had a masonry building that's now this beautiful dog and cat hotel wow. <laughs> right down the street. Um, we sold it because um, it was damaged in the Loma Prieta quake. Okay. And we sold it and paid off all our bills and... Um, it had no more programs, and the Youth Guidance Center, now Success Center, had programs, no money, so we were able to pull those two together, and now we have a real viable organization that's enabled us to, you know, land some other more substantial grants and do more work and really become a true nonprofit corporation. So we're pr real proud of that and have a board that's mixed of community folks and that um, and, and the business community um, who really have a passion for working with this population. So we're, we're, um, we're a little rising star, even though we've been around for a long time, it, we still feel very new still yeah, to this It's work. almost like a new birth, right, over the right. last five, five years or exactly. so. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it's you know, a I good I want to ask though. you a couple of questions uh, about the youth in San Francisco, and I guess um, primarily you know, to focus on at-risk use, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember a few years ago, there was a study where within the United States alone, there was about, there was way over 200 and some thousand African-American youth between the age of 18 and 23 that was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> incarcerated, right? Yes. And seeing that you come from a background of working with Youth Guidance Center and whatnot, you was working within the system mm -hmm. and now, you on the other side, you know, doing this with success with the Success Center, helping young kids get their GED, helping them like get their their minds right, coming up with plans and how to make a goal and how to go for it. And you know, um, tell me in San Francisco, what gaps are you seeing though working with this population and and what are your challenges in helping them to succeed? Um, may I say, through the different systems that's in place that are also like barriers for this population mm -hmm. here in San Francisco? It's very convoluted and complicated, but at the same time, it's not rocket science. Um, we, we, I, I, I helped to um, launch another initiative called the Truancy Reduction um, initiative where we discovered that there are on any given day there's over 5,000 truant students you know on the streets every day and 10% um, of the largest numbers were kindergartners like 10% of the truants are kindergartners and I think equal amount at that ninth grade 10th grade there were about 10% of the of the students were drawing. Well, for the kindergartners, that's not a, that's not a, ba that's not a student, that's not a student problem. That's a family problem. Mm -hmm. um, and for the ninth graders, there's something that we're not doing to successfully transition them from middle school into high school. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes down to African American students, 60% in the ninth and the tenth grade, had a DF or had dropped or were not attending school, had a D or had a failing grade in at least one subject. Mm -hmm. Something is going on. And um, and so, you know, I, we're still trying to unearth and figure it out, but it's those, it's that, um, those challenges and that lack of a success that many of the students um, face and if it's not um, arrested in enough time, then they end up becoming very disenfranchised, disgruntled, and dropping out of school. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And again, it's familiar situations, it's community situations. We at Success Center kind of see ourselves as almost like the, the last house on the block. Because we have to kind of figure out what's going on in the family, what's going on in the community, what's going on with you, your mental health, mm -hmm. what's going on with you behaviorally, what's going on with you academically and, you know, social, economic. I mean, there's just so many things. And life is complicated for these young people. But if they're not succeeding in school, mm -hmm. um, that's a true indication of... Um, problems and troubles as they try to transition into adulthood. And so, but before we can even, when they come to Success Center, we don't even worry about that. We try to get to the core of the individual and try to understand what are your interests? Mm -hmm. How can we make you feel safe? Because mm -hmm. there's so many young people that can't even leave without, you know, a four block radius from their homes. But see, that's that's those are some of the some of the variables, I guess, as far as what could be affect when we start getting into what could be affecting these youths, right? But you just touched on something that was really spoke volumes, and I hope our audience caught it. That, but when they come to the success center, you able to get in one on one time to spend with them to get to the core issue or what they may have that may be barriers for them to get to the next level. So then my question is still the same because you also work with foster children from foster mm -hmm. homes as well, where in San Francisco, we from uh, a guest we had on our show, 80% of the African-American children, mm -hmm. which is only 3% in San Francisco of African-Americans, 80% of these children are in foster care homes that I don't even think a lot of people really know this, right. right? And so, and some of these children are the ones that when they get older, they, they look to get emancipated. Right. You know what I mean? And some of those children end up coming to you and your program. So in between that, and we haven't even got into criminal justice, the ones committing crimes and whatnot, who in, in, in some cases, I, I want to say forced, some may disagree with force because everybody have a choice, correct? Right. But if you don't have the guidance, if you don't have the guidance at home because your parents is overworked, they working two, three jobs making me where rent start off at $2,000 a month here. Right. And, and that's single, right? Huh? We One ain't talking bedroom. about a two, three bedroom yet, right? Mm -hmm. So they working two, three jobs to make ends meet. There's nobody really there over the child with a TV. During the daytime, they at school. They in, they they in some classrooms no. that got at least thirty kids or more in the classroom, right? Where some of these teachers at times and they bringing in teacher aid, and then they trying to psychoanalyze them or they afraid of the children, right? That's they afraid true. and then come to conduct disorder and you know to acting out because of what they lacking at, at home, home or some even go through abuse or whatever at home as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. So if they not getting it at home. <laughs> They not getting the focus they need to be getting at school. And I will say that some of the stuff that they being taught, I think some is being thrown on them ahead of time where, like, you in second grade and you reading fifth grade uh, kind of work, you know what I mean? Yes, or vice versa where mm -hmm. they still in the industrial area with the teaching unless right. it's on computers. Right. So all these different mixed messages is going on to a child, you know, where we see adults acting out. Mm -hmm. These are children. That's going through a lot of stuff from the moment they wake up to the time they walk out that door. You got peer pressure. Uh, our uh, psychologist, Albert Bandura, talk about social bonding and social modeling and those type of things that children need to be have in place for them to even get to the next level. Mm -hmm. They're not getting it. They don't get it. And that's a, <clears throat> then there's such a huge dichotomy between, like you're saying, the exposure that you know many of the kids that we serve get resources that they get and they have, like you said, the social modeling. We can go back to probably as early as I can go back to two years old, but most people can go back to at least five years old where they had somebody in their life modeling good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Somebody in our household got up every single day, got us ready to mm -hmm. go to school while they went to work. Sometimes they left to go to work before we even left out to go to school, came back, tired, cooked, Helped us with homework, started all over again every for years. I mean, that that's what we knew. 
These young people don't have that model for them. And especially if they, like you talked about, come in, going in and out of foster care homes, in and out and in and out. No stability, no consistency in their life. Well, at Success Center, they can find, most of our staff have been there 10 years, right? That's have right. been in the business, have been around for a long time. They know we're going to be there on the hill, on the campus of the Juvenile Probation Department. Mm -hmm. We ain't going nowhere, mm -hmm. right? Stake in the ground. And they know that when they come in there, they can get something to eat. They got somebody to listen to them. We got some good advice for them. We got some resources for them. We can get them back into school. We can get them a job. That's important. Those are the things that basic, just basic stuff that folk need. The rest of that stuff is really compl complicated and, like I said, convoluted. But we got staff that are savvy that know, let us help you navigate those systems. Because it is quite daunting navigating the school system, navigating the juvenile justice system, mm -hmm. navigating the foster care system to make sure you have your basic needs met. That's all they want, place to stay, food to eat, mm -hmm. roof over their head, mm -hmm. job that can help them, transportation, just basic stuff. But for our young people who have no guidance, no one to show them how to navigate the system, we teach them how to fish. Mm -hmm. And I feed them the fish. You got to come in here and learn this because there may be a day that we're not there. But you still going to need to know how to navigate these systems. You're still going to need a job. You're still going to need to educate yourself. Still going to need a place to stay, blah, blah, blah. And then hopefully you can help support and teach somebody else. Well, you know, I think also that need to be taught in school how to navigate systems. Yes, you know, it And does. I don't think they should wait like... Some well, that's part of the game, right? Graduate school to learn make about it, different systems, right? Right, but so, that's part of the game. Let's make it as complicated as we can because we know some of y'all ain't gonna make it out. But see, and that's my problem. That's and too that's bad. That's why I asked you the question because even though I said San Francisco, I want to start here because that's where we at. But it, it's nationwide, so you know, I think it's kind of like. Um, it's the duality of saying, you know, our children come first, but in reality, our children really don't come first. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like somebody talking with a double-edged sword, you know, mm -hmm. and you get these slogans, children first, but at the same time, our children are flunking school. Wow. Um, why are we flunking here and we're not flunking in Asia? <laughs> I'm just putting, you know different what I mean? Different values. It's like, yeah, the values are different, and it's like, why? I mean, you know... Every time you turn on even the news, there's a different issue. There's a, a, not a different issue. There's a maraud of issues, mm -hmm. right? And every time you turn around, there's issues, issues. So you got children waking up in issues. Right. You got children waking up in situations. And, and they and, and the parent may not even know how to help the child with the homework, right? Or have time to help the child with the homework. Because by the time they got home and did cook or whatever, tired. they tired, right? So then the child well, they went to had school. problems navigating the district or navigating the school system or navigating systems, period. And it's all daunting, right? And so they don't know either. And pride sometimes can keep us from asking those questions. And well, just I'm one, can you, you help me? Well, I'm going to tell you, as a parent, I done went into the school systems. And, and on first day of school, first day of school, I'm like, do y'all have tutors here? Right. And, and I'm not going to say the name of the last of uh, this present school that my daughter's in. I went in there and asked, do you guys have mentors, uh, uh, tutors here? And they're yeah. like, oh, we're going to have some. Uh, what do you mean you're going to have some? You know, I don't want my daughter just playing when it comes to after school. Right. right here in San Francisco, you know, coming up through certain schools here, you know, in the after school programs, one minute they got some type of after school program where they can get a uh, uh, mentor or whatever, mm -hmm. right, tutor, then next you know it's gone. It right. might be for three no weeks. No consistency. It might be. It's no consistency, right? And so you got children that want to thrive that's not thriving. One minute you got uh, you got arts and craft and music. They might want to get in something else where after from reading all day, now they're playing an instrument or dancing. Mm -hmm. Then next you know school don't have it no more. Right. You know what I mean? It's like it's no consistency. I myself then donated to schools. You know what I mean? I mean, and that's the key. pizzas and everything. And that's like, the key, Frank, is that as a parent, not... 
we got to be just as involved. We can't just rely on our on the district to make decisions about our what we need and we know our children's need and want in their education. And if no more than just showing up and being a presence there as much as we can, we understand families have to work and whatever, but we can't be afraid to, like you did, ask the questions. Will there be tutors, their mentors, and hold them accountable, right? Music. Music is what saved me in school because it gave me an outlet to vent. And, you know, there's no art and there's no music and there's very limited. Those things are privilege if you're making the grades. Mm -hmm. If you're not making your grades, you don't get referred to the music class or the sports team or whatever. Um, and I understand the carrot and the stick effect, but, you know, those things are sometimes just held up for the elite, right? And not... Those are some. Those are the things. Like for me, that saved my life then and kept me motivated, and encouraged to do good and get good grades. Not available all the time, even for the better students. But as you notice in those schools where the parents are more involved, there's a consistency. They're buying pizza and donating to the school and making sure that there's music in the schools or that the sports team has uniforms that fit and that are <laughs> fresh and new because that's all esteeming to young people, right? right. They need those things. And, that, and again, it demonstrates that some adult cares about my development. Well, I'm with you with that. And at the same time, playing devil advocate, you know, I even remember we was talking about children first. And I remember the excuse for bringing up the lottery, bringing the lottery mm -hmm. in California. That so much of this money was going to be going toward education of our school systems. But we got schools closing down. Right. We've been having schools closed down. You know, ever since this war, right, in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, we didn't have schools closed down, especially in the poor districts, right, of San Francisco. And it's like, okay, well, where's the money going? It's not going to these children, so where is it going? But... The reason why I brought this up is because you guys have a success record. Yeah. You know, you guys are really living up to the title success. And I want you to talk a little bit about you. A couple of minutes talk about the success rate and, and what you guys have accomplished since during the last five years to make a difference within the young people's lives. Yeah. Well, we... Um I have to attribute it all to the young people, and I have to thank them for entrusting us just one more time, one uh, another adult, one more time in their lives. Um, and to the staff for, you know, understanding that and being there for them. But um, there once were 19 county and community day schools. Now there are four, and we're one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and among them, we graduate 80% of, of all the, the graduates, which we're really proud of. And we enroll 100% of them in the, into college because we, we teach our young people. you got to be a lifelong learner That's like you, fantastic. Frank. we got to keep throwing it up against the Wait wall. Wait say that again. 80%. 80% of, of the court and county community school day students are graduates of the Early Morning Study Program, which is a program of success in there. And 100% of them did what? We enroll them into college. That is success. Because we want them to know that um, this, is, this is cool. You know, GD is a cool step for a stepper, but you need to continue to be a lifelong learner. Um, keep thriving, even if it's just to get a certificate. Get it. But tell me, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tell me. See, you rushing that a little bit. What is you guys' secret that you then got 100% of an 80% graduate class? Enrolled in college. Enrolled in college. Come on. These young what is people. What that you guys are doing that other places are not doing? What is it that you guys are doing? We have the trust of the young people, and we are exposing them. Nobody's ever exposed them. Nobody, they never thought college was an option for them. They never knew you can go to college with a GED. Wow. They never thought that, they never knew how, the only jobs they knew were drug dealer, probation officer, teacher, doctor, bus driver. There's a whole world out there. You can be, and you can get into broadcast communications. What is that? We try to expose them again. We start off with, 
What are you getting to know them? What are you like? What are you interested in? But wait a minute. And wait we minute, take the Liz. time to try to See, introduce them to their humble, dreams. Right? I know you're a humble person. I get it. And I know it. And and ladies and gentlemen, she wasn't nominated for change agent. She was nominated for change maker because she opened up doors and she create pathways for for people, disadvantaged people even for people who's not disadvantaged, because she do have a career center as well that she mentioned earlier, One Stop. But but Liz, come on. But Let's Frank, talk about the time. How much time do you guys put into these children? To as long as it them? takes. As long, as long as it takes. I know you probably have been victim of this too, but I'm up at 4 o'clock every morning, right? I tell my staff, I get the Gangster Chronicles at the foot of my bed every morning, and literally I do. Right, because that's right. the time where I got to read mm -hmm. reports and mm -hmm. white papers and all this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. we we sit down and we make individualized strategies and plans with these young people. Mm -hmm. If you if we're not giving you what you need, you know, we want to know what are your dreams, and we try to as best we can with very limited resources. We're not rich by any means. But try to expose them if it's through, you know, technology or actually taking them to see different things. We want to expose them, right, to different opportunities, different possibilities. And you see the light bulbs go on. Right? See, I'm seeing the light bulb go off, too, because whereas, and I'm going to use my child's example, they take them to the zoo or just up to a park. You taking them to career centers. You taking them we to take see them other wherever. entrepreneurs. You taking them to universities and schools. Mm -hmm. You are actually really exposing them to see something beyond, beyond the immediate that. environment. And to do it. So we really, you know, one of the things that I've been harping with the district and other educational institution is, with this population, we need to contextualize the curriculum, right? It's not just enough to say, here's a book. Here's some pamphlets, A, B, C, one, two, three. But let me show you, because most of our young people don't understand, why do I need algebra? Why do I need history? Is ge Am I ever going to use geometry in my life? How does, What does this have to do with me? Right. So we actually take them and demonstrate through our lessons that it has a lot to do with you, that right? Powerful. You cannot... Um, it, so we, we, we've done urban gardens, for example, right? Because there's a huge component. Natural science is a huge component to the GD. So we've written to the Public Utilities Commission, and we've created in our little bitty concrete space some planter boxes. you got to know <laughs> what incredible. to plant, when to plant, how to plant, how far to plant these things apart. Incredible. And you can just see the light bulbs go on for these young people. Incredible. They've developed hydroponic systems taking the resources, water bottles, and PVC pipes from just what we had laying around the agency and researched these things and created these hydroponic systems. Wow. And I had to threaten them, if you grow in anything else <laughs> than vegetables and flowers, I'm going to kill you. But they're interested in it, right? Right. And we've grown bell peppers, and we've grown flowers. we got a lemon tree, jalapenos. Wow. And then they eat them. And that is so powerful. They're never going to forget that. And it's going to inspire them to, now we got them eating healthy. Now we got them interested. Now they can see the applicable uses to algebra and the science lessons that we had them in, delve into. Um, you know, other um, young people have been, um, we've, we've, we had young people that were um, averse to um, um like a lot of street violence. Um, and then others who think they want to be a professional ball players but um, have, don't have the exposure or the grades or the things that someone on track to play in sports were. Mm -hmm. So we take them over to visit an anatomy lab. That is powerful. See that you too can get into sciences. You need to see this person is gone forever but what can we learn from this individual who has dedicated their body to science? Wow. Or this is the impact of smoking too much cigarettes. Look at this tarred lung. Wow. They get to see, that right? And then the light bulbs go. I mean, that's what we want for our kids. That's what I want for every kid. If my kids, if your kid ain't safe, my kid ain't going to be safe in this community. And I need to live and 
and get old in a community that I was born and raised in San Francisco and know it's going to be safe. Wow, Liz, that's fascinating. I asked you and you sure gave it to me. And you know what? You know, if people just realize, well, what I say people, I'm going to talk about providers and whatnot to really be educated and realize that you can just give a curriculum and speak all day long, but you have to have that, that, that niche. Like, you got that niche. That's what separates you from the average. You got to have that, that, that type of compassion that not only are you trying to, trying to teach them something, but you're trying to instill hope and purpose. See, I'm not too much on hope. I'm on purpose. On purpose. You know, because, see, I've been taught hope, you know what I mean, and hope don't get you that far. Mm -hmm. But when you instill a purpose to take and be creative with them, to show them and even make it as if it's their idea, you know what I mean? It is and their that idea. And that's coming through a set, assessing them, right? When right. You said we sit back and we talk to them. And, right. right. And then you showing them, like, even how to even plant, plant uh, how to nurture planting, right, how to do harvesting and those type of things and that light bulb go off and they like fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. They take that and own that, right? right? And that's the same thing we do with you guys in the criminal justice system yep. as well. So mm -hmm. I commend you and the reason why I wanted it out there is so that those that's watching it, you know, can have something to go to the educational system about right. and talk to them about, you know, how do we upgrade the way we're teaching our children in these schools. Absolutely. Because I believe there should be a pipeline from, from um, high school into employment, which you guys have been doing a very great job at even getting the kids employed. So they want it. They, they want really want to right. do it. They don't want to have to look over their shoulders. They want legitimacy and structure in their life, contrary to popular belief. Mm -hmm. They want that, and we try to give it to them, um, but still give them the place and the space to dream. Well, we thank you guys, and um, so we 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 running we just now we running out of time. You said and, it was um, going to go by fast. And I told her we would be through mm -hmm. way quicker than she thought. Mm -hmm. So this is Liz Jackson Simpson, my guest, and I want to thank you for being thank here. You. Tell them one more time how they can get in contact with your organization. Yes, thank you. Um, Success Center San Francisco is located at 375 Woodside Avenue. Our phone number is 415-753-7690. Or our Western Edition Neighborhood Access Point is 415-549-7000, and it's located at 1449 Webster Street. Come on through. Yeah, invest in our youth, invest in this center. Uh, and once again, I'm Frank Williams coming to you with real issues and real situations that happens out here. And once again, want to thank the CEO, the founder, the executive director of Success Center San Francisco. And I'm Frank Williams. Goodbye. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Sing it! Open my mind with the truth, Jimmy. Open my mind with the truth. Open my mind with the truth. Now I'm going to live my life like a deuce. Sing it! Open my mind with the truth, Jimmy. Open my mind with the truth. Open my mind with the truth. Now I'm going to live my life like a deuce.